G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So before the video begins, I would like to give Raid Shadow Legends a huge shout out for sponsoring this video. Raid Shadow Legends is a brand new collection RPG game that is taking the mobile gaming landscape by storm. It provides an incredibly immersive experience, the best I've found on a smartphone in fact. It can only really be compared with the biggest PC and console titles, but the best thing about it is that the game is totally free. It has all the features that you'd expect from a brand new RPG title amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. More than 10 million players worldwide have already downloaded the game in less than 6 months too. In Raid, you have the ability to personally customize your champions, choosing their artifacts and creating a unique mastery build for each one of them. But what I love about this game too is that everyone can find something for themselves. Some love collecting characters, some are about the deep storyline and graphics, and I personally enjoy the PvP aspect of the game and the fact that there is always something new to do. I think that the game is amazing, but you don't just have to take my word for it. With over 300,000 reviews, Raid has almost a perfect score on the Play Store. The game is growing super fast and the highly anticipated new Faction Wars feature is now live, and there is a new awesome rewards program for new players. You can get a new daily login reward for the first 90 days in the game. You can also find me in the game under the nickname Bee Buster. I tried Buster Nut, but it was taken. And if you're quick enough, you can also join my clan. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. This occurred in 2009. I was 22 years old and was leaving my home state of California to head east for my corrections job. I was driving down the loneliest highway portion of the route and it was around 3am on a Sunday. But they don't call it the loneliest highway for nothing too. I mean, I hadn't seen another soul for at least a half hour. I was getting sleepy but I wasn't tired enough to pull over and take a nap or anything when I saw a broken down car on the side of the highway. I slowed and I saw a woman standing next to the car. I approached this woman with caution, rolling down my window just a sliver, because something about her just wasn't right. I couldn't put my finger on it then, but I know now that it was my subconscious just screaming red flag. But I asked her if she needed me to call a tow truck or AAA for her or something, and she immediately tried to open my door. I explained to her that I didn't feel comfortable letting her in, but I'd wait until a tow truck came. She immediately got this look of rage on her face, started berating me, you're a big man, what am I going to do to you, saying I was cruel for not letting her in. And this is where I messed up. I can see it now, ten years later. I begrudgingly unlocked my door, figuring that she's right. She at most is 5'2 and I'm over 6 feet and have 100 pounds over her. She looked to be about 90 or so pounds. But she slips in and I ask her, who can I call? This was 10 years ago, so I had a little Blackberry slide, I think, at the time. She starts telling me that she'd just prefer if I'd give her a ride to the next town. And now I'm starting to realize that I've messed up because she's avoiding eye contact and she's fumbling in her purse and when I mention calling for help she's getting aggressive demanding that I take her to the next town. I'm so busy trying to untangle this situation that I miss a man who either was hiding in or near her car and it wasn't until he was almost to my driver's side door that I managed to catch him in my rearview mirror. Flight or fight kicked in and I put my car in drive and sped off right as the fucker was reaching for my car door. I sped off and I heard a ping noise and then my rearview mirror exploding because he was shooting at me. The adrenaline alone had me doing near 90 and by this time, homegirl realized in whatever drug and induced stupor that she was in, her little plan was futile. She started hitting me and telling me to stop and let her out and when I reached enough of a distance, I did just that pulled over and demanded that she get the hell out. She started going for the oversized purse that she had, but I had enough and I was literally shaking with adrenaline. I reached over, opened the door and just pretty much kicked her out. 
I tried grabbing for her purse, but she managed to hold on to it, not before dumping half of what was in it there on the passenger seat. I sped off, my door still open. I waited until I got a good distance from her and slammed it shut and locked it. I then clenched the wheel and drove, if on something autopilot. It wasn't until later that morning too that I pulled into a Denny's did I realize just how close I was to pretty much dying that night. I had a good cry and then I realized a bunch of her things spilled onto my passenger seat. Most of it was just nasty watered up napkins, a few tubes of lipstick and drug paraphernalia. I had considered calling the cops or finding a highway patrol officer or something. And I did something stupid. I tossed all of her things that had fallen into a trash bag and just threw them away. At the time, I had the dream of becoming a cop and knew if I got caught with drug paraphernalia that that would be impossible. I didn't think that they would believe me that the drug paraphernalia wasn't mine. I noticed a cop at the gas station across from Denny's and I told him what happened. He pretty much berated me for pulling over and then letting her in like that. He did say that he'd look into it, but I doubt that he did. I was so shaken up that I pretty much picked up my pancakes and then just left to continue on my way. I never did replace that mirror and I ended up selling my car as where I lived didn't require me to have one. Until this day, ten years later... I hesitate to stop and help stranded motorists because of that night. So, uh, this all happened only yesterday, and I'm writing it down now while the memory is still fresh. My wife and I have been talking about it pretty much non-stop since it happened, and have been unable to come up with any explanation that doesn't involve something supernatural or inexplainable. I would love for you guys to help me figure this out so that we can just forget about it. I'll try to keep this all as short as possible too, but I need to make sure that you get all the details so you can help us figure this mess out. This is not your average, my house is haunted story. I'm telling it to the best of my ability and this is all 100% true, I promise you. So, yesterday we planned on going on a four mile hike. The trail makes a big loop with the beginning point also acting as the ending point. And the story begins in the trail parking lot. There were about five other cars in the lot and out of the car nearest to us came a middle-aged couple. We paid them no mind as we typically do with strangers and as we headed off to the restroom before hitting the trail, they set off on their own hike. When we started the hike, we chose Route 1, doing the loop counterclockwise. The trail itself makes a huge loop about 4 miles in length, with the parking lot being at the highest elevation, and the lowest point being the middle of the trail. The ascent from the bottom middle section to the top, going either direction, consists of giant limestone canyons that require a good bit of rock climbing, making them extremely steep, slow, slippery, and very tough to climb. And this is very important information for later. So, about 20 minutes into our overall 3 hour hike, we reached point A, where we caught up with the older couple. About the time that we caught up to them in the canyon, they decided to turn back towards the parking lot, passing us along the way. We exchanged smiles and waves as we passed, and again, we didn't think much of it. Now, from point A to point B, everything seemed pretty much totally normal. We were hot and tired, of course, but were enjoying ourselves, and thought very little about the other couple. But when we reached point B, about two thirds of the way through the loop, just starting the uphill climb back towards the parking lot, however, things started to get a little weird. As soon as we exited the low lying canyon region, we saw the same couple heading towards us, as if they had returned to the parking lot and opted instead for Route 2. But we still didn't find this to be completely out of the ordinary as the first canyon, around point A, was tough to get down and it seemed that they were somewhat unprepared, if I'm being honest. I mean, the woman was wearing a knee-length skirt, a very bad choice for sliding down slippery canyon slopes and climbing steep rock bluffs, and it also appeared that they hadn't brought a pack with water in it or anything, basically. But we passed them again, exchanged pleasantries, and we just continued on. This time though, we did talk briefly about the situation. We found it odd that they made it far enough to meet us at this point, as the first parts of routes 1 and 2 were steep and slow, 
and the area between point A and point B was pretty flat and steady. Considering the difference in terrain and their age, and the fact that the woman was wearing a knee-length blue jean skirt with slippery shoes, we agreed that it was pretty strange to see them at that point on the trail, but we just continued on anyway, just shrugging it off and thinking no more about it. Soon afterwards, we made it to the Outlook, which was a couple of hundred feet above the bottom section of the trail, and ten minutes past point B. As we paused to take some pictures and catch our breath and whatnot, my wife pointed out that she could hear their voices down below in the canyon as we rested. We listened and mutually agreed that it was probably the same couple since the point the voices seemed to be coming from would be about the right spot for them to be, given the last location we saw them at, that is, and the lack of anyone else on the trail so far. Still, nothing too strange yet. But then we reached point C. Now, between the outlook and point C, which was 20 minutes from the end of the loop and 40 minutes from point B, was a wide gravel trail with steep drop-offs on either side. You could say that it was a sort of ridge as everything within the loop made a giant bowl, much like a volcano, with the elevation difference between the lowest point of the trail and the highest point of the trail being about 500 feet. And this made the terrain around the trail seem pretty much impossible. I mean, it was extremely steep and covered in thick undergrowth and fallen trees. It seems to be pretty much a given too that the established trail is the only way to get from the outlook back to the parking lot. As we neared point C, we were becoming increasingly exhausted and ready to be done. We stopped once or twice for about 30 seconds to just catch our breath and as we got closer and closer to point C, it was as if the energy was just completely sucked out of both of us. Of course, the trail was tough, but we had done it, and many like it before too, and it was not even 80 degrees outside. Even as our mental focus began to waver, and we started noticing a significant change in our demeanor and attitude, we marched on though, knowing that the end of the trail was near. But when we reached point C, everything changed for the worse. Now, keep in mind... We saw the older couple about 40 minutes earlier at point B, and there is no way to reach point C from there except the trail that we were currently on. There were no shortcuts, there was no realistic way to pass us without us knowing, and definitely no way to possibly beat us there. And yet, there they were, sitting on a bench on the side of the trail, calmly eating lunch at that. Now, even if they did find some way to get there before us, they just didn't even have a drop of sweat on them, and their demeanor just did not fit at all to the situation. I mean, they just shouldn't have been there at all. As we passed them, the man mentioned something about a picnic to us and smiled, laughing, and we tried our best to respond in kind, but the mood was as if we had just walked into a giant black cloud of smoke. I really don't know how else to explain it too, but the area around them just disorientated us completely and we no doubt were pale as ghosts and obviously pretty shaken. We passed on by them though and as we were out of earshot, my wife turned to me with a face that I had never seen before in my life. We were terrified. Without saying a word to each other, we both experienced the same just feeling of shock. It felt as if we had just walked through a time warp or something, or as if we had just brushed up against another dimension. Our following discussion amounted to this too. There is no way that they could have beaten us there. Sure, maybe, possibly, just maybe there was a chance. But only if after seeing us at point B, they sprinted through the woods in a direct line towards point C... But this would have required them to run up the second canyon, steep rock bluffs, throughout the unmarked woods, and who knows what else for over a mile, in under 40 minutes as well. Now that's how long it took us to get there, going at a pretty good speed, using the clear trail, which, as a crow flies, was not that much longer than a direct route from B to C. We're in our early 20s too, and in decent shape as well, and we were dead tired by the time that we came to see them and based on their apparent level of preparedness and fitness, and no judgement here, only stating what we could see. There is just no way, even if they did take the direct off the trail route, that they could have made it there before us. On top of that too, they somehow found two Bud Lights and a lunchbox full of sandwiches on the way, and 
were already almost done eating them by the time that we met them at point C. All of these things combined with just the overwhelming feelings that we got when we encountered them at point C have left us in mental shambles for the past day. It took us six to eight hours to fully recover and regain our sense of normalcy. Shaken is an understatement. The hairs on our neck stood on end and we felt almost ill if that's the right word. But we have no idea what to make of this and no clue how to explain it in a way that even begins to make sense. So, if you guys have any ideas, then please help us figure this one out, because it's beyond me. So my father was in the army for 21 years, retired and moved to a very small town in central Florida. He got bored after a couple of years, and even though he didn't need the money, between his retirement and what my mum was making as a bookkeeper and tax prep, he wanted to go back to work. He started working at various gas stations, and it being a small town, the owners wouldn't care if I came there and helped out with the stocking and the coolers, or even running the register, as long as I just didn't sell any beer or smokes. But this all took place in the late 80s and early 90s as well. Now, the actual story I'm going to tell took place in 1990, and I remember the date well because it was shortly after my birthday, and being 15 in Florida, I had just gotten my learner's permit, and my dad let me drive him to and from work, just to get some experience on the road, both at day and at night. So I was sitting in my usual spot at the table that was set up along the windows, book in hand, feet propped up, and a Mountain Dew on the table along with some snacks. I would generally spend most of the evening that way too, just reading books, getting up to run to the register and stock the cooler at different times, and just stuff like that. I remember glancing up too because something caught my attention that was a bit unusual, and I realized that a lady was walking up our parking lot from the direction of the interstate, the gas station that was right on I-75. This in and of itself was really strange because where we were located... You didn't get many people just walking in like this, and definitely not walking from the direction of the interstate. I figured that she must have broken down somewhere though, and was just coming to use the phone to call for a tow truck or something. But boy, I was completely wrong. She came into the store and just looked around for a few minutes, and I remember getting just a strange and really creepy feeling about her. She walked up to the counter and started telling my dad a story about how she had gotten stranded and needed a ride up to the next big town up north from us. Osala was the town and this is pretty important. My dad lets her know that he's working and there's just no way that he can take her. She turns and looks at me and while she's looking away from him, my dad catches my eye and subtly shakes his head no. I was confused for a second but... Then she turns back to my dad and points at me, asking if I can take her. My dad responded back that I only had a learner's permit and wouldn't be able to drive her anyway and then drive back. But normally, I would have done it, even though it was illegal because I'd done it a few times before already in fact. I didn't argue with my dad though since this was completely out of character for him. I mean, he was normally chatty with the customers, but... For whatever reason, he was just almost curt and dismissive of her. Turns out that he had a bad vibe about her from the minute that he had seen her walking up the drive. And well, she cusses him for a minute and he basically tells her to get out of the store. She slammed the door open and I thought the glass was about to break from how hard she had slammed it. And then she just stalks out of the store and down the driveway. I keep an eye on her and continue to watch as she makes her way back up to the interstate and then just starts up the northbound on the ramp. Almost a year passes and I'm in my bedroom less than a week before my 16th birthday. I hear my dad yelling from the living room, son get your ass in here now and look at this. I quickly run to the living room and I see my dad pointing at the TV and I look at the mugshot of the lady on the screen and immediately remember the lady who had been in the store that night. Turns out that I almost gave a car ride to Eileen Warners, who was later convicted of being a serial murderer and then later put to death. I've had a few stalkers in my life and quite a few weird things happen, but 
none of those things, none of them bother me like this one does. I was about seven or eight, I think, in the 80s when I answered the phone one day and a man on the other end just somehow pulled me into a full-blown conversation. I don't remember what we talked about or why he said that he was calling, but we talked about an hour. I don't remember anything creepy from that conversation, but not that one anyway. But over the next year, he called six or seven times maybe, and each time we talked a bit more. He usually let me talk, all I wanted, and I told him a lot of things. I didn't really know why I did this, but I just did. Maybe because he was the only person who ever listened to me and didn't blame me for everything. He was always just sympathetic and on my side. My home life wasn't that great. He also had this... Uh, really raspy voice that was slow and really soft sounding. But for about five years, he would call for a few weeks at a time, every three or four months. Eventually, he told me that he traveled a lot and was only in my area certain times of the year. He also said that he worked with kids, but never told me what. Over those five years, his questions just got more personal, though. more leading and more sexual. But he had eared some kind of sick trust from me, and though I was reluctant, he eventually got me talking about sex. By the time that I was 13, I just knew that our conversations were really wrong, and I started avoiding the phone at that point. I never answered if I could help it, and whenever he did catch me answering, he would make me feel bad for avoiding him, like I was his only friend or something. And to be honest, sometimes I must admit that I felt like he was my only friend too. Around that time though, he told me a story of a girl around my age that he had messed around with at a camp or something. How she'd asked him to touch her somewhere and I felt very uncomfortable when he told me but continued to be nice because I was a little afraid of just making him mad. I don't know why, just my instincts I guess. And one day he called me and told me that he'd seen me that day walking home from school with my friends, and told me what I was wearing. I was thoroughly creeped out now, and I was definitely beyond scared. I don't know why I didn't tell my dad, who was a police officer by the way. I guess I thought that I'd just get in trouble because of all the stuff that I did tell the guy. Then he asked me to meet him at a Walmart parking lot in my house. I told him that I would, but I definitely had no intention of doing so. My phone rang just so many times that night and I just wouldn't answer. But when someone did answer, no one was ever there and I pretended like I just didn't know anything about it. I stopped answering the phone altogether after this and I made scheduled times for my friends to call and I never walked home alone again. I never talked to him again after this. But he did call, many times in fact, up until I was 16 he would ask for me and I'd say that you have the wrong number and I would just hang up as soon as I heard his voice that is. But that's not the end of it. In 2005, I was in college. I was about 30 at the time. I was driving home from class. I was flipping through stations on the radio and a voice caught my attention. I kept listening and I was certain that it was his voice and I was dumbfounded. It was a Christian station talk show talking to a guest who was a youth pastor who traveled around, and I know that it was him. He even told some stories to the station that he had told me before. I listened the whole way home, and when I got home, I just turned it off and I tried to forget about it. After a few days, though, I thought that I should contact the station, but my radio wasn't that station anymore, and I just couldn't figure out which one it was. In 2015, I was visiting my sister though, who was 20 years older than me, and we got to talking about it. I told her a little, and she actually told me that he had talked to her too a few times. But she didn't know that he ever talked to me. She didn't know who he was, or how he got our number, or anything, just like me. I still wonder sometimes if he's still out there too, preying on young girls, or vulnerable girls, or what... I hate thinking now what he might have done to someone by now, and I hate that I never told my dad. Even though nothing bad actually happened to me, it did affect my whole life, mainly the way that I am with my own kids. No one really understands why I'm so overprotective, even my adult children now. 
I just don't really trust anyone outside of my inner circle, and I eye everyone as a potential creep. It's kept me and my kids safe, I guess, but it didn't allow for much living, so I guess that's kind of unfortunate. So, I'm going to share my two biggest experiences that I've ever had. So back in August, my girlfriend and her family went on vacation to the south of France for two weeks. My mother asked if I could stay in their home for those two weeks and care for their pets, a small Malteser and a black cat. Not having had any vacation this summer, having this house to myself was a chance that I wasn't about to pass up. I'll tell you about the house first though. It's a pretty cozy, um, three-story terraced house with a garden. It used to be two stories in an attic, where my girlfriend's room is now. My in-laws bought it after the previous owner died inside his living room. Me and my girlfriend have joked about him haunting the place and not liking me in particular. We've also nicknamed him Patrick since we couldn't remember his name. So, a few days in, I decide to go to the gym. I close every door and window in the house since my mother-in-law is very particular about that. And after about two years, it's become a habit, I must admit, but I go to the gym, I get back, and every single door downstairs is half or wide open. Except for the door to the garden, it's a pretty damn heavy door. I'm 100% certain that all of them were closed, and I got pretty spooked seeing them just all open suddenly like that. I also felt a pretty bad feeling of, like, dread or something, but... This might be the slight shock just wearing off, so I won't count that. That was the first really memorable experience during those two weeks as well. But there was also a second. So I was in the living room, which used to be a shed, I think. I just sat down with my dinner and was just watching some YouTube or something, when suddenly I just had this chill go down my spine. But I didn't think too much of it. I just thought maybe there was a breeze. But a few seconds later, the door to the hallway opened just very abruptly. And not like a windy whoosh opening too, a full-on door handle being used, handheld opening of a door just really fast. And then it shut in similar fashion too. But for some reason I decided to jokingly say, Yo Patrick, could you do that again? And lo and behold, this door opens and closes once again. In a less hard-handed manner this time, I must admit that. I was more impressed than freaked out since I've always sort of believed him to be there but never thinking of him as uh, malicious. It's hard to explain but the way the door opened it looked like when you walk into the wrong room and realize halfway and then you just back out quickly. So that makes me think that Patrick may have just been confused about the new layout of the house or something. But those were my two biggest experiences within those two weeks. There's always been slight bumps in the night, chills and other stuff that you'd expect, but nothing major like that. I would love to hear all of your opinions on this though, and if you would like, please feel free to leave a comment below. I'm not sure how old I was, but I was really small, maybe around 6 or so. I was with a bunch of people from my church just having a barbecue at a river. All of the kids were swimming in the water. I didn't know how to swim yet, so I was just staying waist deep in the shallow part. At some point, this girl came up to me and was playing with me. We were splashing each other and stuff like that. But the weird thing was that she was probably 13 or so, and I didn't know who she was, even though I knew everyone else there. Apparently, though, nobody was paying attention to us. She started pushing me out deeper and deeper to where I couldn't touch the ground anymore, she just kept laughing the whole time and my head kept going underwater. I tried grabbing onto her arms when she would push me, but she easily knocked my grip loose. The slight current slowly pulled me away from my friends and family while I struggled to tread water. I was panicking, but she wouldn't stop pushing me and laughing. I could not possibly have looked like I was having fun at the time. I would try to yell, but was only ever above water long enough to just take a breath. Every time my feet touched the mud for just a split second, she would push me down again. I just couldn't believe that she was laughing. I was sure that I was about to drown, and no one seemed to notice. And of all people to intervene, it would happen to be my childhood bully, Zachary. 
He had always been a jerk to me, mentally and physically abusive, but I feel like that day, he actually saved my life. He came up and told her to get away from me. He grabbed me by my arm and pulled me up to where I could stand again. Then he just ran off and continued to play with the other kids his age as if nothing had even happened. And the girl was already a ways away too. I went on playing and as with so many other things, I don't think I told anyone until I was much older. And I'm pretty sure that I never saw that girl ever again. I live in Madagascar, that island on the east of Africa. A lot of people here still believe in magic, sorcery and all that stuff. Despite being very much a big Christian country. But my dad died in 2012 and he lived and experienced uh, a lot of things in his life. He was a Christian and didn't really believe in witchcraft and magic stuff. Although, even he would admit that he experienced a very strange thing back in the 80s. My mum and aunt also confirmed this story too. In 1985, before I was even born, my dad caught pneumonia and was rushed to the hospital. My mum and my auntie were there to look after him, buying medications and all that sort of stuff. My uncle, that's my aunt's husband, Knew things about black magic and traditional stuff like witchcraft. And when he visited my dad on the 4th or the 5th day in the hospital, he told him something. He gave him a piece of ginger and asked him to keep it in his hand for the next two days. My dad asked why and my uncle told him that on the next two days, an evil person who wanted to hurt him or even worse will come to visit him in this hospital room. And apparently, holding that piece of ginger will keep this evil person away. Now, my dad did not believe a single word of what he said, but my mum insisted to do it because she knew my uncle was really serious about it. And so my dad just kept the ginger in his hand for the next two days. The very next day, while he and my mum were in the room, someone knocked at the door. My mum opened it and one of my dad's co-workers and a friend was there with some flowers. My mum told him to enter, but the guy just stayed right there and then said that finally he wasn't going to enter the room. My dad saw him and told him that it was okay to come in, but he was just standing there in the threshold, not moving. And then he just did the strangest thing. He just turned around and walked away quickly without even saying a word. And later, when my dad went back to work, his co-worker and that same friend, they weren't working there anymore, and after that... My dad never saw or heard from them ever again. So this was around late 2010 and early 2011. I was 15 at the time and I was spending the weekend at my best friend's house. My name is Talia and two of my other friends, Jade and Shauna, were there too. Our friend Jack lived across town and he wanted us to come over to hang out. It was a 10 to 12 minute walk to get there, but it was 9pm and a Saturday night, and Talia was skeptical about walking across town in the first place, so she just stayed behind, but the rest of us figured since there were three of us walking there, we should be safe. And for the most part, we were. So we get to Jack's house, and he'd been drinking out of his mother's liquor cabinet, he was 17 at the time, and two acquaintances of ours who were dating each other and having problems in their relationship were there drinking too. It was annoying for me to be there if I'm being honest since none of us wanted to drink and one of the acquaintances was drunkenly spilling her life story to me about how she wanted to break up with her boyfriend because she was in love with her ex and yada yada yada. But basically just crap that I didn't care about. I mean, I barely knew this girl but I listened and just tried to help her through a drunken banter while we were there. So, 11.30pm hits and Jade and Shauna decide to call Talia's mum, who honestly treated us as if we were her own children, to come and pick us up because, of course, no one wanted to walk back at almost midnight, even with there being three of us. The drunk girl didn't want to leave, so I felt bad and I stayed behind and told Jade and Shauna that I'll just walk back later on. For better or for worse, I just didn't have a concept of fear. I was, according to rumours at school, one of the most intimidating girls in our class, always carried a pocket knife on me, was going through my goth stage, etc, etc. 
I knew the town like the back of my hand too, so I didn't think that it was just such a big deal. I finally leave, and this is where it gets creepy. So I'm walking back across town to Talia's house by myself, just texting Jade the whole time to make sure that she was still awake so she could open the door for me. It was 12.30am and I was walking fairly fast, almost jogging, because I just had a feeling about being out by myself tonight for some reason, so I just kept up the pace. I make it to the main street in town and Talia's house was two or three blocks away from it, a straight shot pretty much. I looked both ways before I crossed Main Street and there was one car coming from my right in the distance, driving about 45 miles per hour I'd say. So I bolted across the street before the car came up and as soon as I did that, the car comes to a screeching halt and whips itself onto the road that I was walking on. Luckily, I heard the screeching tires and my instincts instantly kicked in. And so I darted into the bushes in front of somebody else's house because my brain quickly comprehended that something just didn't seem right about a car driving so fast down the road. The speed limit in this town was like 25 miles per hour. At this time of night, then making this quick turn just out of nowhere. I stayed crouched in the bushes. They were pretty thick and like I said, I was going through a gothic phase so I was wearing all black luckily and I had the night to my advantage and I just watched this car slowly creep down the road next to the house that I was hiding outside of. Almost like the people in the car were actually looking for me. I held my breath and I watched it continue down the road and turned around in a parking lot, then watched it head back up to Main Street. As soon as that car got to the stop sign opposite from where I was going, I just bolted. And I have never run so fast in my life. All the while, too, I'm texting Jade with my difficult flip phone, telling her to open the door now. Everything was like it was on cue, too, and I make it to the front steps of Talia's house, and as soon as I got to the first step, Jade opens the door, and that same car comes flying down the road that I was on, hitting the gas and revving the engine, passing the house. It honestly felt like the person or the people in the car were mad. Jade sees me out of breath though, barging into the house, asking me all of these questions and as soon as she locks the door, I told her everything. The next morning I told Talia, Shauna and Talia's mum about what happened too and Talia's mum pretty much went white. Because apparently the man had actually been caught a few towns away from ours for stalking and assaulting another woman and around the same late hours of the night too. She pulled the news report up on her phone and we read it, and I instantly recognized the car as the same one. This happened well over 10 years ago, so I'll try my best to describe the events accurately. So, one of my childhood homes had a balcony that was attached to both my mother's bedroom and mine via big double glass doors in each of our rooms. Next to the balcony are two trees, one I often used to climb up and down from the balcony. But this balcony faced out to the street, but one night when I was about 13, 13 year old girl that is, and my brother and mother weren't home, I was reading in bed with a very dim reading light. And I heard what sounded like something moving in one of the trees outside. But this didn't worry me too much as possums and bats are pretty common in our area. Now, I had thin curtains on the glass doors that separated my room and the balcony. As mentioned previously, the doors faced out towards the street where the street lamp light was always visible through my curtains. Shortly after hearing the tree rustling noises, I see a shadow slowly move past the doors, at which point I immediately turn off my reading light and freeze like a deer in the headlights. But the shadow is tall, so it definitely wasn't one of my neighbor kids that I'm friends with, and it wasn't my all of five foot mother. The person moved slowly though, creeping as though they were trying not to be noticed. They wouldn't likely be able to see into my room, but I could see them thanks to the streetlights behind them creating a dark silhouette. They moved past my doors out of sight. I sat there unable to move or even think about what to do other than be absolutely still. That is, until I heard another sound. The sound of someone trying to open a glass door my mum's doors to the balcony. I didn't know if she had locked them or not, but 
I wasn't taking chances. I moved as quickly and as silently as I could to my bedroom door and I locked it. I listened for what the person was doing now, but they were still jiggling the glass door handle, but it sounded like the doors weren't opening. And at that, I felt relief because this person couldn't get in, surely. And all I had to do was just wait for them to realize that, and then they would leave, right? Well, I heard light footsteps move back along the balcony to my set of glass doors until I saw the shadow stop directly in front of them. Again, I froze. He couldn't see me. He couldn't know that I could see him too, though, and I saw a shadow of a, a hand reach up to the door handle, I think, and my heart stopped. Had I actually locked those doors myself today? I mean, I was out there earlier. But what if I forgot? The seconds leading up to him grabbing the handle felt like an absolute eternity, but thankfully, when this person tried to open the door, it didn't open which meant that it was locked. I sighed such a sigh of relief, I was worried that he actually heard it. After this, he began pacing the length of the balcony. I didn't have a mobile phone, as my mum thought me too young to have one yet, and the landline was at the other end of the house, but I was too scared to take my eyes off of this person, even to call for help. I was silently just sitting there crying, tears falling down my cheeks as I internally prayed that they would just leave. But then I heard him stop moving, and then he said, Hey, I could just break the glass, you know. Before I could even process this, I saw car headlights turn around the corner of my street and then stop at our property gate. My mum was home. The person on the balcony moved out of sight, and I heard a loud thump as they jumped off of it. When my mum came inside, I was obviously hysterical and was barely coherent, telling her what happened. Eventually, though, I got the message across and she called the police. They never did find or catch anyone, but strangely enough, a neighbor reported a truck in the street that matched the description of a truck that had been reported recently for attempted child abductions near my school just a block away. And since I walked that short distance daily, the police suspected that he had actually followed me or seen that I lived there and waited for me to be alone. So, let me start this story by saying that I'm dumb. Like, not unintelligent, but I just have zero common sense. I'm completely naive, and most of the time, I rely on my friends telling me not to do stupid stuff. I'm at university too, and just started my second year. My first year, I used to go out partying all of the time, which did get me in a bit of trouble, so I figured this year, I'd focus on my academics and join a few societies on campus and whatnot. I joined the debate society, exciting I know, and they had a little function so everyone could get to know each other. I walked in and I saw this girl who I think I vaguely knew, I think we met on a night out of something, and I went over and I said hey, and we started chatting, but for the sake of privacy I'll just call her Rosie though. So Rosie's a really nice girl, like annoyingly sweet, and her being in a debate society didn't really make much sense to me, but... I didn't want to judge, so the debate society leader comes in and we do an icebreaker and we all take stupid debate subjects and we have to debate about them like why mermaids should have equal rights and stuff like that. So I go up to do my debate and when I sit back down, Rosie is talking to some other girl introducing herself. I go over, introduce myself to the new girl and we get chatting. After the function ends, we were leaving and Rosie invites us to come for a drink in the university bar to meet some of her friends. Me and the other girl didn't really have much on, so we decided that we would go with her. We walk into the bar and we sat in the booth, and in the back corner of the room is two really tall guys and another girl. And not significant that they're tall, but they were like seven foot I think, and I felt the need to mention it. Oh, and uh... I should point out that the other girl from debate didn't know Rosie, she just kind of met her as well. But we sit down and we get chatting about life and they're asking me about my family and about how many Instagram followers I have and what I'm studying and they were all really charming, like spookily likable actually. But then one of the guys turns to Rosie and says, I think Johan would really like her. So I ask who this guy is and they just laugh and tell me that I should meet him. 
So here's me, a 19 year old, recently single girl, thinking I'm about to be introduced to my next potential husband. Rosie agrees with the guy and says that they've got a table at a club that weekend and that I should go with them. So I agree. I mean, who doesn't want free alcohol, right? I stay a bit longer, but then my flatmate asked me where I was, so I got up to leave, and as I was leaving, Rosie pulled me aside and said, Hey listen, I'm really glad that you're coming out with us, but could you not invite your flatmate? She's kind of annoying. I felt really awkward about that one, because well, my flatmate is like my best friend, but I agreed anyway. So fast forward to the weekend though, I'm getting ready to leave and my flatmate asked me where I was going. I lied and I told her that I was just going to a school friend's birthday party. I met up with Rosie and we went to the club and a host shows up to the table. There were the two guys and the girl from before and another guy stood in a black shirt and trousers above 25 and he is absolutely stunning. Like, the city I live in is full of poses and pretty boys anyway because they all want to be famous but he was like really fit. So I say hi and he introduced himself. He pours me a drink and compliments my dress. Rosie comes over and is like, she's in the debate society. We know each other from freshness. One of the club promoters I know sees me and comes over to the table, gives me a hug and we get chatting for like five minutes. And Rosie comes back over and is kind of blunt and gets rid of the guy that I didn't think much of at the time, but it was a bit weird. We did some shots and we had a dance and we actually had a really good night. I remember everyone was off dancing and I went back to the table to get something out of my bag and the guy was sat at the table texting someone and I sat next to him and he was like, so Rosie, tell me, you're in the debate society, right? I nod and he goes, you should join our society, but we could use someone like you. And he winks. Now, I may be dumb, but I know when someone's flirting with I asked what the society was, and he says, and I quote, Oh, uh, it's not on the university website. It's privately sponsored. Why my dumbass didn't just get up and leave? I have no idea. That should have been my first red flag, I know, but no. I'm twirling my hair and batting my eyes like, sure, I'll join your society. He adds me to a group chat on Instagram, though, with 14 other people, including him, a mix of boys and girls, and... I ask him what the society is about, and he just smirks and says that we host events, don't worry, it'll look good on your CV. So the next week or so, the group chat sets up a meeting at this restaurant, strictly black tie dress code, so I go and I meet everyone, and we have a dinner all paid for by the society, and they're talking about an event that they need planned for one of the sponsors or something, and they start saying just some really weird stuff like how they need to be low key and downstairs needs to be quiet. But bear in mind too that this is being hosted in a town hall that they said that the sponsor won't be happy if they have ugly girls. And then the leader says that I should co-host this event with him. So this was a couple of days ago now and the event is on this Wednesday and I guess my question is have I joined a society sponsored by the rich to make little university aristocrats? Or am I about to be sold into sex trafficking? I mean, either way, I'm probably still going to go on Wednesday. I'm this far invested, so I might as well see what happens, right? Update. So, uh, my professor replied to an email saying that he doesn't recognize the name on the society, but there are some private societies outside of the university that the uni does actually recognize, so he would email the department leader and ask him. But it's just getting really weird though. Like, at first I was kind of joking about the cult or sex trafficking thing, but I messaged the group chat yesterday saying that I think I was coming down with something and wasn't sure if I'd make it to the event on Wednesday. And then this morning, I got up and there were flowers delivered to my house with a note that said, get well soon. And like, I haven't told any of these people where I live. And that's a pretty scary thought. I've notified campus police because, I mean, what the hell, don't deliver crap to my house, right? But at this stage, I really don't know what else to do. From 1993 to 1998, every summer I attended a Christian youth camp for girls. 
camp lasted four days, three nights, and there were about 200 girls at the camp, and it was about a one and a half to two hour drive away from our homes. Some of the camping areas were tent only, others had A-frames, and at least one of the camping areas had longhouses. The campground is called Ensign Ranch, and you can look online to see pictures of what these different camping areas look like if you'd like. It's a really safe campground though, and we had a lot of fun every year. And in the evenings, we would all tell spooky stories, just pretty typical stuff for youth camps. Now, on the last night of the camp in 1996, I was 15 at the time, and there were several of us girls in the top level of our longhouse. It was way past bedtime, so we were quietly just telling scary stories, and I had told a couple, one with the help of a friend, Lily. I don't remember the specific stories from that night, but just typical and the hook was hanging from the car door kind of stuff. After a couple of hours of spooky stories though, somebody else was talking and I was getting really really tired and I could hardly keep my eyes open. Then some of the girls asked me to tell one more story so I start telling a story, making it up as I go, just typical on a dark night in the woods not far from here type beginning. And the next thing I know I just wake up lying flat on my back. As I'm waking, I realize that I'm still talking, but once I became aware of my own talking, I couldn't remember what I was saying or trying to say. I was fully awake then, and I finished by lamely saying something like, they all died, the end. I looked around me at the girls, who were all staring wide-eyed at me, and a couple of the girls were quietly crying, mouths open in horror with tears streaming down their faces. My friend Lily whispered, but that was the creepiest thing that I've ever heard. The girls that weren't crying nodded in agreement. I said that I was tired though and we should all just go to bed. As all the other girls moved away to their sleeping bags, I asked Lily and another girl, Sarah, what I had said. I admitted to them that I'd fallen asleep and couldn't remember anything. Lily and Sarah exchanged glances and Lily paused before saying, that just makes it worse. Sarah nodded in agreement and said that she didn't want to retell it because it was that creepy. Now, at this point, if it had just been Lily and one or two of the other girls that were in that group, I would have thought that they had realized that I was asleep and were just messing with me. But Sarah was and still is a very serious person who doesn't really have much of a sense of humor, doesn't like pranks, even innocent ones, and is honest almost to a fault. And so... I went to sleep feeling pretty unnerved that night, and really exhausted for some reason. A few hours later, I was being shaken awake by one of the adult camp leaders. She told me to gather my things and follow her, and I sleepily and awkwardly carried my stuff down the ladder, then followed her outside. Two other camp leaders were standing next to a tent. They told me to put my items inside and then come talk to them. Inside the tent were two of the younger girls, 12 or 13, that had been listening to the scary stories and who had been crying when I woke up. But they wouldn't look at me, they just laid there, sobbing. But when I went back outside to talk to the leaders, they said that Lily had showed up to their tent with the two sobbing girls. The girls were crying and kept saying that they wanted their parents to come and get them. Lily explained about the scary stories and about mine being the one that made them cry. The leaders asked me what I had said and I admitted that I had fallen asleep and honestly didn't know. The leaders said that Lily refused to tell them what I said and the two girls that had sobbed harder, the more that they tried to talk to them, the more they just refused. They explained to the girls that they weren't going to call to wake their parents at 3am and have them drive over an hour just because of spooky stories, plus we were all going home the next day anyway. As punishment for scaring the girls, the leaders made me sleep in the tent with them while the leaders went to sleep in the longhouse. The girls did cry for a bit and eventually we all just fell asleep though. But they were both gone from the tent when I awoke in the morning. To this day, I still have no idea what creepy story I actually told. No one that was there has ever been willing to tell me any of the details. Several years afterward, Lily told me that she would randomly have nightmares because of it. The only details that I ever had answered were, my voice has sounded the same as usual, my eyes remained closed for the majority of the story, which creeped them out more, and the story was coherent and made sense up until the end when I lamely finished speaking. 
Again, though, if it had only been Lily and a few of the other less serious girls, I would know that they were just screwing with me, but Sarah and most of the other girls that were there, including one that cried most of the night, even being part of a prank on me just doesn't seem probable. It's a strange story, I know, but it's something that just remains a mystery to me. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support and I'll see you mates in the next one.